are going to go now to our guest speaker, Robert McWhorter. Janice, you're going to introduce I'd, him. I'd be glad to. Yep. First, thanks to Larry Bodine for uh, giving us the tip off that Bob McWhorter had some things to tell us. Bob's a practicing attorney and a specialist in criminal law and an internationally recognized speaker on immigration law and the Bill of Rights. We asked him to talk about voter suppression bills and the Arizona fraud it, but he may throw in some things about insurrection too. So thank you very much, Bob McWhorter. I could do all of that in 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, this specific talk, uh, yes. Dropping the musket to reach the ballot, a brief history of voting rights. Um, as we know, the Republicans have advanced more than 100 bills restricting voting. Representative John Kavanaugh, Republican on CNN. I'm sure a lot of you caught this quote, but I just had to note it again. Democrats value as many people as possible voting, and they're willing to risk fraud. Well, my thought about that when I read that was, well, yeah. I mean, I'm happy to own that one. Right. Republicans are more concerned about fraud. We don't mind putting security measures in that won't let everybody vote. But everybody shouldn't be voting. You don't have to debate the facts here about what the purpose is with these bills. It's pretty darn clear. I, I got to start with a little math, okay? The Maricopa County fraud, right? There was 2.1 million votes in Maricopa County. That's 1% of 2.1 million is 210,000. Now, Biden won by 0.3%. So that's 63,000 votes. What they are saying is that for a fraud to have occurred in Maricopa County, there had to be a conspiracy of 63,000 people in order to, to affect the fraud for that 3.3% uh, margin. Uh, now, Biden was the first Democrat to win Maricopa County since Harry Truman. So I could see why they're a little bit shocked. But I mean, 63 million, dollars, million people in a, in a fraud. Statewide, we had about, you know, over 3 million people. Biden won also by 3.3%. 0.3% is 115,000 votes. That's a conspiracy of epic proportions to pull off. Now, Republican Trumpers are claiming that over 100,000 people entered into a voter fraud conspiracy for Biden. I have been a Democrat my entire life. And the great Will Rogers always said, I'm not a member of an organized political party. I'm a Democrat. We are not that organized to get over 100,000 people into a conspiracy. It, it's just not our strength. OK, a lot of times leading Democrats is like herding cats. Right. OK. But at any rate, uh, that's just to give you some of the numbers for the lunacy of these arguments about voter fraud. Now. America began with the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Okay, America as an, as, an, as an ideal and a concept. What we have done is expanded the franchise and the ideal of America. Now, early America voters had to have sufficient property to qualify, white males who owned a farm or lot or a town lot of sufficient size and were required to be followers of the Christian faith, okay? And of course, there was no voting for people who were property. Um, so these are requirements that all the states originally had. The original constitution left all decisions of voter eligibility to the states. And for the most part, the existing constitution does. And I'd be glad to take questions about the problems it could cause if we do get a For the People's Act through. All right. Jump ahead 100 years, uh, more or less. The Emancipation Proclamation did not free all the slaves. The 13th Amendment actually did that. But what it did, and what I think was actually more important, not symbolically more important, but practically more important, was it officially authorized Black men to join the Union Army and Navy. Frederick Douglass knew that these men joined not just to end bondage, but to have a place in political life recognized. William Tecumseh Sherman, who by anybody's measure was a, was a racist, said, when the, hand, when the fight is over, the hand that drops the musket cannot be denied the ballot. The hand that drops the musket cannot be denied the ballot. Around 180,000 black men fought in the Union Army, over 20% of those eligible. This is a far higher enlistment rate than whites in both the North and the South. You often hear about the so-called Southern fighting spirit. It's pretty much, it's just a myth. Confederate armies overall fought no better than Union armies. 
it's part of this lost cause argument because Southerners were fighting for their independence. They fought better, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if the argument has credence, then the fighting quality of Black Union soldiers fighting for their freedom and the freedom of their spouses and children was just as good, if not better. And I'll cite you, of course, to the movie Glory, which clearly shows that, and it by far and away is the best Civil War movie ever, ever produced. Right. What happens after the Civil War? You get the amendments to the Constitution. And why is there progression? 13th Amendment abolishes slavery, yet some continue to argue former slaves were not citizens. The 14th Amendment, by the way, Kentucky didn't ratify the 13th Amendment until 1976, and Mississippi didn't ratify it until 1995. The 14th Amendment said all persons born in the United States are citizens, yet some continue to argue that not all citizens could vote. All right. Maryland didn't... Uh, ratified until 1995, California 1995, and Kentucky until 1976. So back to Kavanaugh, but everybody shouldn't be voting. Well, okay, President Ulysses S. Grant pushed hard and lobbied hard for the 15th Amendment, which was ratified in 1870. Full citizenship and suffrage. In 1870, the Ku Klux Klan and other groups killed scores of black people and to discourage their voting. That's why the 14th Amendment reads, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. California did not uh, ratify until 1959, Cal uh, Oregon 1959, California uh, 62, Maryland 73, Kentucky 1973, and Tennessee didn't ratify this until 1997. If I was in part of any of these states, I'd just be embarrassed about the fact that they failed to ratify. Now, why this is so significant is the 15th Amendment is the first time voter eligibility is not left to the states. The original Constitution leaves it all to the states. The 15th Amendment is the first time that says, no, we have a national standard on this subject. Now, the 15th Amendment's fathers, of course, Ulysses Grant, etc., but I think the role of Black self-determination in the Amendment's foundation has to be clearly recognized. The hand that drops the musket cannot be denied the ballot. So why did the Civil War amendments not work right away? Okay, well, the answer is at first they actually did. There was a flowering of black franchise, except in the franchise, first African-American Senator and Congressman of the 41st and 42nd Congresses, 1869 to 1873. You had real active black participation in the vote. Karen Rhodes Revels was the first African-American U.S. Senator, represented Mississippi in 1870, 1871 during Reconstruction. In the Civil War, he helped organize two regiments of the United States Colored Troops and served as their chaplain. When you gave the vote and assured the vote to everybody, Black people could get office in the South, and that's what happened. It also didn't hurt that a lot of the Confederates were kept from voting because they had just been, you know, of course, traitors to the United States. All right. Well, the success was short-lived. These redeemer governments, the ending of Reconstruction, just totally changed the dynamic and squashed what had been the first flowering of freedom in the United States and the vote. Uh, the Jim Crow South gets institutionalized. The 1876 election, Republican Rutherford V. Hayes cuts a deal with the Southern uh, delegates to the Electoral College in order to win the presidential election against Samuel Tilden. All right. Well, what happens is 1877, Hayes withdraws federal troops from the South. Uh, from 1890 to 1908, Southern states disenfranchised most blacks and by the way, many poor people who also were affected by things like literacy tests, but they didn't care about that because the idea was to maintain the aristocracy in the South. Political exclusion lasted until the federal civil rights legislation in the 1960s. The Democratic Party's appeal was to racial stereotypes, um, always this ugly propaganda about the Republican platform. Now, remember, at this period of time, it was the Republicans who were the good guys on race and the Democrats who were not so good, especially the Southern branch of the Democratic Party. Now, a lot of this legislation goes to the Waite and Fuller Supreme Courts, who were absolutely abysmal, the worst 
decisions in the history of the Supreme Court. I believe these decisions they made were worse than Dred Scott because at least Dred Scott, you could argue, well, that was the constitution at the time before the Civil War amendments, right? These guys hobbled the Civil War amendments. They narrowed the scope of them to render them effectively meaningless, uh, and which allowed the Jim Crow South to take hold. You know, you, you, this is also affecting, by the way, Native Americans. Uh, this is Eli Parker. He was with Grant at Appomattox Courthouse when Lee surrendered. He actually was a, a Lieutenant Colonel Brevet big, Brigadier General. He wrote the surrender document that Lee signed at Appomattox. Uh, he was uh, Grant's, the first Native American appointed to uh, Commissioner of Indian Affairs. Uh, he couldn't vote in most states in the United States. Race, juries, you know, when you talk about the vote, you also have to talk about how it affects voting juries because, you know, the voter rolls were usually the source for jury rolls. Emmett Till was a 14-year-old child who was murdered in Mississippi in 1955 because he supposedly whistled at Carol Bryant. Uh, Bryant's husband and his half-brother abducted this child. They mutilated this poor child. Uh, they shot him and sank him in the river. Uh, he was retrieved his body three days later. His uncle identified Brant and Milam at trial. In September 1955, an all-white male jury acquitted in just 67 minutes. One of the jurors said, if we hadn't stopped to drink a pop, it wouldn't have taken that long. All right. A year later, Brant and Milam admitted to mur murdering the child, but of course the double jeopardy clause prevented their retrial. In Batson versus Kentucky, the Supreme Court in 1986 said you cannot exclude a juror on the basis of race. The right to serve and vote belongs to the juror, not to the defendant. Okay, this would have excluded this. And how does this come out? The racial composition of Derek Chauvin's jury included six black or multiracial jurors. The right to vote makes a difference. And you can look at the right to vote in the context of juries in a smaller context but we also understand the right in the much larger context. Emma Till's case became key, a key foundation to the Civil Rights Movement and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, as did the murder of three young men during the Civil Rights Movement in June. Andrew Goldman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner were murdered by the Klan. Their bodies were found over 40 days later, and you could not initially identify who was a black man and who was a white man. This was a subject of that movie, a fictionalized version, Mississippi Burning, uh, Gene Hackman and William Defoe. Um, look, this was key to making the final push for the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The Voting Rights Act prohibited racial discrimination in voting. Um, Section five had a pre-clearance procedure prohibits certain jurisdictions from implementing voting laws without attorney general or US district court pre-approval. They had a coverage formula. These are the states and smaller jurisdictions where it applied. And if you'll notice, there we are, Arizona, right smack as one of the states that required pre-clearance because of this state's history of voter discrimination. The act massively increased voter turnout and registration among black people. Now, the response of the Republican Party to the Voting Rights Act was the Southern strategy. Electoral strategy to, to increase political support among Southern white voters appealing to racism. The civil rights movement deepened existing racial tensions in the South. And if you look at the South, the Voting Rights Act, most of the states line up perfectly with the states with the history of racial discrimination and the strong bloc. Richard Nixon, Barry Goldwater developed strategies that contribute to the political realignment of white conservative voters to the Republican Party, and it pushed the Republican Party further to the right. This is the greatest realignment of party politics in American history, which is why we are the good guys now on racial issues and the Republicans are not they left behind the legacy of Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant. And, and by the way, it, it's, this is not a subject of debate in public life. In 2005, Republican Committee Chair Ken Milan apologized for the Southern strategy. Michael Steele has been very vocal on this very issue. So this is not really a, tub a topic of you know, public debate 
about whether this happened and what the intent of the Republican Party was. And of course, if you look at the map today, the Republican strategy still works for Republicans. Trump took the South in the last election with, of course, the little issue of Georgia there because of what's, you know, Stacey Abrams, who's kind of a force of nature. Getting poor whites to vote against their economic interest is what's going on here. Okay, what happens? Things are going well with the Voting Rights Act, but Shelby County versus Holder comes in in 2013. It declares that coverage former, uh, formula unconstitutional over the dissents of four of the justices. Very close decision, right? No longer responsive to current conditions. Um, Chief Justice Roberts writes the opinion, things have changed dramatically since 1965. Problems remain in these states and others, but there is no denying that due to the Voting Rights Act, our nation has made great strides. Our country has changed, and while any racial discrimination in voting is too much, Congress must ensure that the legislation that passes remedy that that problem speaks to current conditions. All right, look, Section 2 of the 15th Amendment says, Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. If you say there's no denying and the, the problems remain, well, if problems remain, the 15th Amendment says Congress shall have the power to enforce appropriate, with appropriate legislation. Pre-clearance should have been constitutional, at least the formula there, all right? The late, great Ruth Bader Ginsburg, of course, wrote, throwing out pre-clearance when it has worked is con and has continued to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Gotta love Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I kind of wish we could do a weekend at Bernie's thing and kind of keep Ruth Bader Ginsburg there, but unfortunately that doesn't work. All right. But she's the only justice I know that you can get a full tattoo of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I don't think any other justice in the history of the court qualified to get an RGB tattoo. All right. So, okay, here you have the effect. The Republican laws in Georgia and Arizona, who were both subject to preclearance, could never have passed Section 5 and Section 4B's coverage formula. That is what Shelby County versus Holder gave us. That is why elections matter, and that is why the composition of the court matters. This Texas Senator Brian Hughes claims there were 400 voter fraud cases in Texas. I'm gonna do my little math thing here. In actuality, there's only been in the history 43 uh, and only one in 2020 in Texas, but okay. There were 11 million people who voted in Texas. Okay, 1% is 110,000 votes. Even if he was right and said there was 400 cases of fraud, it would have been made no difference at all in the election. This is the lunacy again of these voter fraud claims and the need to protect from them, all right? Even the fictional claim of 400 matters not. All right, I'm going to wrap this up quickly, and then I'm more than happy to take questions. Look, we the people includes all of us, or the subtitle is why we're going to win. Even after the Civil War and the 15th Amendment and Voting Rights Acts, there remains two Americas. One is dedicated to the proposition that all people are created equal, and the other does not. One is fighting for the vote. It's an expansive view that America is a big country of universal rights with an inclusive constitution. The other is a limited America. Citizens' boundaries are strict and some people are considered by them inferior. Let's quote from our friend Kavanaugh here, but everybody shouldn't be voting. Those lines are clear. And it would, by the way, be unfair and unjust to say all Republicans believe that because they do not. But we know what's controlling the Republican Party right now and it's not the people we can talk to on these issues because they have a different view of America. The irony of American history has always been the American creed's most devoted adherents are often those historically denied its promises. Black Americans did not abandon liberal democracy because of slavery, Jim Crow, and the systematic destruction of whatever wealth they managed to accumulate. Instead, they continued to fight in two world wars to defend it. America is great because Japanese Americans did not reject liberal democracy because of the internment or the racist humiliation of Asian exclusion. Instead, they took up arms to defend it. America is great because women did not abandon the vision they are we the people and they fought 
for the work of the day, for the taxes we pay, for the laws we obey, we want something to say. And they didn't give up until the 19th Amendment helped America grow into herself. We all now also have the 24th Amendment, which prohibits poll taxes, and the 26th Amendment guaranteed the vote to 18-year-olds. All right. These are the really the only things that officially kind of put a national standard of voting, because much of this is still controlled by states, with the exception of a very few cases during the Warren Court under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. The right to vote is a promise. Now, I have written a lot on the Constitution. I think I'm a good writer. But if you're a really good writer, when you can steal somebody else's stuff that's really good, you steal it. And I can't say it any better than Abraham Lincoln when he said, it's a promise that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. That is what we fight for as Democrats. And that is why we are going to win. So is there any other questions? Thank you, Bob, so much. We do have one question that I saw in the chat from Allison. Can you please address the Equal Rights Amendment? First of all, unfortunately, it didn't pass, although there's an ambiguity right now about whether the required states uh, have passed to ratify it and what is the time limitation of a ratification. Right now, it's standing in abeyance. Uh, a lot of arguments can be made that many of the provisions in the Equal Rights Amendment would be covered by a correct reading of the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause contained in the 14th Amendment. Uh, I personally think, look, pass the Equal Rights Amendment. It seems fundamental. As far as a direct mechanism on the right to vote for women, I think the 19th Amendment is pretty solid. I'm not sure that an Equal Rights Amendment would expand that, but it would certainly expand rights in other ways. I also, look, the next thing I might say might be a little flip, but I always kind of like to go with the, the idea of if an alien landed here and read our constitution, I kind of want to make sure there's something in there that says, hey, women count equal too. I mean, you can say they do, but if they just read the, the basic document, you know, the, the, the owner's manual of the United States, it really needs to have an equal rights amendment in it. Time for one more question. Nan wrote, why can't these new proposed laws not be challenged via the 14th or 15th amendments? They can be, and the vehicle would do it is again, is the equal protection clause of the, of the 14th amendment and also the 15th amendment. And you're gonna to have to structure the lawsuit to show that the racial disparity is being caused. And unfortunately, we can't do that until the damage is done. So a lawsuit in the American criminal, or excuse me, the American constitutional system, you can't go to the court and ask for an advisory opinion. You have to have a damage that's already been done to you. If you recall, that's why the court threw out the latest challenge to Obamacare, because Texas hasn't been damaged. The unfortunate thing is the damage has to occur before it happens. And that's really the unfortunate thing of Shelby County because the statute created a mechanism to protect from the harm and the court threw out that pre-clearance that was there. Now you can create another pre-clearance formula and hopefully that would pass constitutional muster because they didn't hold the pre-clearance formula unconstitutional per se uh, under the 15th amendment and that part of the 14th. But Again, most of the time, by the time it gets to the court, you know, you've already got the damage done. I have a question. Is an, an affirmative federal right to vote actually in the Constitution? Can you oh. speak to the question about historical artifacts such as the Electoral College and the right of states to select electors? The answer is no, there is not. And the only exceptions are what I've listed in this, uh, in this talk, like, of course, the 15th Amendment. States decide everything with their electors. They decide who's going to be the electors in total contravention to the intent of the framers. Now, the framers, for instance, uh, Alexander Hamilton, Federalist Number 68, said, oh, the Electoral College is going to be great because it's going to be free from party factions in states. Well, that's not what happened. The state parties define that. There's a faithless elector. The party moves in, whether it's Democrat or Republican, yanks that person out quick and puts uh, party faithful in there. The Arizona statute is found in Title 21, for instance. I forget the specific statute, but uh, that's just the state controls. And there's no 
constitutional standard, a national constitutional standard on that at all. It's pretty frightening uh, because if you start having things where a legislature can come in and redefine who the electors are, which is what, by the way, the Trump administration wanted the Arizona legislature to do in this last election, that's, a, that's, that's scary because there's not a constitutional prohibition. Thank you, Bob. Right. You, you've given us a lot of food for thought. Interesting day. It, <laughs> it has gone from morning until night. Thank you so much for, for joining Thank us. You. Thanks so much. Good night. Thank you.